Karen, Miles. At least I've got some people here. This is good. It's not like there's no one. Unfortunately, I think he's going to be there for just letting off me. As soon as I get my water off. behind the curtain here. She's going to be practicing her sign language interpreting. Yeah, well, they're worth it. Yeah. They may still. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Okay. I've got my drink of water. Someone's just phoned me, so I'm not going to answer them. So. <clears throat> I'm not contagious. I've actually got really bad allergies to dust. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> hi, I'm um, Karen J. Carlisle. Um, I write steampunk and fantasy and Victorian mysteries and other stuff. Um, so today is an, my author talk and I really didn't know what to talk about so I asked a few people um, what they wanted me to talk about and some people said word, world building. That's like a two hour talk unto itself but I'll quickly have a look at that. Um, and another one said um, why do you write, write steampunk and another one said how do you write steampunk? and why do you do independent publishing? So I'll just have a quick look at that. And if we've got time, someone maybe... Sharon, have you got a watch? Do you want to tell me off when I get too close to time limit? Can you tell me when I've got 10 minutes, when it's 20 past, and, I'll, and if I've got time, I'll do a little read of the next book, because someone said also can we do a, a reading. So, okay, so. I'm assuming people here know what steampunk is, so usually if I do a talk for other places I'll go through what steampunk is, but why do I write steampunk? Well, I'm, I'm one of these apparently weird bunch that love science and art. Apparently I got told at school that was a weird thing, but I think it's not. Um, so with steampunk I get to put in science because I try to have most of my science reasonably accurate and I get to shove in a bit of art and fun with it too. It's a bit of whimsy so I actually like doing alternate history and I change it. Like the first book, uh, Dr Jack, is about Jack the Ripper because you know I've been a th thing about Jack the Ripper for quite a long time and I've got a friend who's a Ripperologist and so I did my version of um, Jack the Ripper um, and he's being or may not be organised by a secret society and then a furious plot to take over the Empire. So you know things you know, things, history doesn't always happen the way we think. Uh, I like it because it's whimsical. You can do all sorts of weird and wonderful things. And that brings me to how I... Right, I'm basically... I sit down and I just get an idea and I write. Um, I do tend to have mostly um, female protagonists. That means like the hero, the person who does stuff that people are supposed to cheer for. Um, and I like writing with multiple points of view. So I write with the good guy's point of view and the bad guy's point of view. So in the Dr. Jack one, you get to get inside the head of Jack the Ripper. Well, what I think might be inside the head of Jack the Ripper. Um, I tend to um, probably do more classical style of prose um, because it is Victorian mysteries. So it goes in with the genre. And I like playing around with a bit of humour, so there's, there's a few things in there that, you, that uh, are situational humour and things will happen, but I can't tell you too much because it's spoilers. Um, I do write with minimal bad, bad language because I'm, I'm not a big fan of lots of swearing, well, in, particularly in my genre, it's just, yeah. Um, so most of them are sort of suitable for 12 and up. I recommend the first book for 14 and up because you do get inside the head of Jack the Ripper, which is probably not best for young kids. Okay, so... <clears throat> Someone said, what about world building and steampunk? That was another question I had. So, 
world building is a, is, is a really big thing. So that's basically how you create the world. So in my steampunk, I cheat a little bit. So you've got two different ways you can do it. You can create a whole world from scratch, which is what happens in most fantasy um, novels. They start from scratch, they work out everything. Or you can, um, with steampunk, you can go for alternate history. So you find something in history that's interesting, and then you twist it. And that's what I really like doing. I, I, I go, what if? That's a very big thing that happens a lot in steampunk. People talk about what if. So I get real history and I change it. Or I find one particular thing about history and I'll play with that. What you need to do with steampunk is you need to decide how accurate you're going to be. What parts of history are you going to keep and what are you going to change and why are you going to change them? There's also uh, deciding how much steam and gadgets. So some people like lots and lots and lots and lots of gadgets dripping everywhere. If you have gadgets, you really need to have a reason for having the gadget. You can't just, there's an old saying, well, in steampunk people have heard it, don't just stick cogs on it. If you're going to put um, gadgets into the story, you really need to have a reason for that story. In mine, I'm a bit more what they call steampunk light. So in mine, Queen Victoria had a nasty thing happen to her, and it's actually in the first short story. And so she does, she, she's a bit iffy about gadgetry. She thinks that this whole newfangled technology stuff, you know, she's got to control it, because, you know, Queen Victoria was a very, very controlling person, we're told. And so in mine, you have to have uh, permit, permits to have different, to have different um, gadgets. Um, and of course, if you know someone, or you're rich, or you work for someone, you're going to get it. So, I have um, a new, the new series coming out to Department of Curiosity in here, so Viola does come across them. And they're a bit like Warehouse 13. But I had this idea before Warehouse 13 was actually on. So what happens is she, she gets all these gadgets and she puts them, in a, puts them away. Um, you also need to work out how many gadgets you've got, steampunk light or lots of gadgets, and you need to work out whether you're going to have magic or paranormal. There's a very big crossover. You'll actually get a lot of paranormal stuff in steampunk and the small gas lamp, it's a particular genre to itself. And if you're doing that, you've got to work out the rules. So that's a thing like fantasy. You've got to have the rules in fantasy. You've got to have the rules of magic and stick to them. So in mine, I have the rules of science, and there's a little bit of paranormal hidden because I, I'll get onto that in a second. Okay, so with the rules of science, I have science as science, as we've got it, and, I, and I, had, I, was, I had a Bachelor of Applied Science, so I tend to try, to try to make the science logical and accurate, but I also have in my world that the science that Victorians thought existed also exists. So they thought octograms. Now, um, that's where you take a photo of the back of someone's eye after they died and it's supposed to show you what the last thing they saw. They actually did actually look at doing that in real history with Jack the Ripper, but they, it didn't show anything, obviously. Um, so in mine, I talk about that a bit as well. So you've got to have your rules, set down your rules. Um, then you've got in steampunk how much punk to add. So the thing about steampunk is it can be full-on adventure, or you can also put in things like um, women's roles in Victorian society and do that sort of thing. That's the punk part of it. So you decide which way you're going to go in that or there. Um, and from that, then you can start building your world. Okay? So in mine, I actually have three different layers in my world. I've got the everyday layer that most people see. Then I've got the next layer, which is this one here. Um, so the other one's the adventure, and that's what the next series is going to be more in. This one here is more the gas lamp type end of it, so there's the political machinations and all that sort of stuff happening. And then there's a third level, which is the underworld, which actually does have paranormal. So in this world, there actually are some vampires, but I've been holding off writing a vampire story because everyone writes vampire stories. Um, but there is a um, standalone book that I'm planning on writing down the track. So I actually have already worked out the levels in my world before I started reading, uh, writing it. Okay, so any questions about that? I'm quite happy to take questions. Okay, um, another question I had um, was um, what, why do I self-publish? Well, there's, there's different types of publishing. Self-publishing is when you actually produce it yourself and get it printed, and that's what I do. So I do all the covers, the photography, the art, um, the formatting, and I do it through Ignam Spark and it goes through all the bookshops. And then you can go to traditionally public publishing where you send it into um, the publisher. I chose to do this because with my health issues, this is better for my stress and my, my 
sanity at this point in time. But one day I would like to, when I grow up, be a, a hybrid publisher, which means that you also get stuff done um, traditionally published. So that would be very nice. You can find um, uh, a lot of people are starting to do that now. Okay, right. What time have we got? Okay. I've got loose time. Okay, um, you can go and get my books on most online stores, and I'm down the corner, right down the corner. There's a band every now and then right down the corner, so you head down here, turn left at Fire Bear, and keep going down the corner where the band is, and I'm down there if you want to go and have a chat to me, and I can see some familiar faces just popping in now. Okay, um, I don't always, I, I've actually written something, um, a new project I've done too recently is I've actually written a song, which was quite out of the blue, um, for the Litmus Steampunk Band, and they're a band in Queensland, so that's another bit of writing that I do as well. Uh, let's see, and yeah, my notes are actually gone all crooked, so... Okay, right, so any questions so far? Um, yes? What do you find hardest about world building? What do I find hardest about world building? So with this one, it's not as bad because the actual world is there. And the good thing about Victorian um, era is a lot of people know or know a bit or know about a little bit about it from movies, books, whatever we research. Fantasy ones are a little bit different. Like I've just written um, Aunt Enid, which I don't have here, which is a fantasy mystery. It's set in Adelaide and it's more of fantasy, but I've set it in modern Adelaide, so that's a bit easier, but you have to go and do research. For me, I don't find it hard because I was always a bit of a researcher anyway, because I've also done um, medieval and renaissance reenactment, so I used to do that. Um, I live in dread of getting the wrong fact because there are people who you'll do a fact. If you change it, that's okay, but if you have a fact in there and it's wrong, you get told. <laughs> you do, you get told. You go, oh, no, it's not actually that, it's this. So luckily I know a friend who's a true crime um, author and ripperologist, and when I was doing the first one, Dr. Jack, I actually ran a few things through her, but I knew that fairly well because I've been watching documentaries for ages on that. So it probably is, is, is getting the fact straight, and making the decision on what to change, because if you change the wrong things, it just falls flat on its face. Okay, any other questions there? Uh, In your world building, yeah. have, you, well, have you ever come up with an idea that you realised was going to break one of the rules? Oh, and how, my... did, how did you deal with it? Did you? Like... Yes. Yeah. Yes, I did. Um, I wrote it. <laughs> I, initially, I only had the two levels of the world, because I wasn't going to write vampire stories. And then I wrote a short story about Tesla, actually, because um, in my world um, you don't have a lot of electricity and I couldn't figure why, and then, went, then I suddenly thought, aha, yes, if I make it... Oh, I can't see that's a spoiler! Oh! <laughs> if a certain thing happens, then that's an excuse why they don't have electricity. Um, and so from that, this, this other layer, this paranormal layer came in and I've actually got... I've written two short stories in that one already, and I've got a There we go. Oh, that, that, no, come on. Yep. And I've got a standalone book and possibly another one in there. It's in one level of things. So, yes, I have. Card full. Ah, oh, my goodness. Okay. Oh, sorry. You could have said words. <laughs> this is as bad as I get. Okay, right. <clears throat> so, um, okay, this is where I'm going. Oh dear, oh dear, I've left half my notes alone. Yes, I have. So, okay, so um, one of the short stories I wrote which changed the rules um, is The Case of the Murderous Migraine. It's actually coming out in an anthology that's coming out in October. It's a Canadian anthology, but it'll be available online um, called Dead Steam. So they, it's, there's a thing called Dread Punk now. So there's punk everything. There's cyberpunk, which started it. Then you've got steampunk, then you've got cog punk, then you've got tesla punk, then you've got valve punk, then you've got diesel punk. Um, and there's a thing called Dread Punk, which is sort of this, this steampunk, gas lamp, horror, mix over thing. 
I'm not saying any words in it too hard. I should have given you a copy of this. <laughs> okay, right. So, I've had about oh, several people um, say, are you going to do a reading this time? And actually, someone came down to me this morning. Um, hello to wherever you are. Um, and said you can do a reading. So, the new, the new series is Department of Curiosities. And it actually tells us about the pump, which I've mentioned. They've got a big mention in the third book, if anyone here has read the third. Some people are nodding here. Okay. And so I actually delve into that and you find out why it exists and a bit more about it. And it's through um, the new characters, Tilly. Um, and she's sort of about, about 21. And she's uh, meeting these people in a very interesting way, which you'll find out in a second. And she meets this other guy who works for the Department of Curiosities. And as she goes through, she's learning more about this Department of Curiosities and also while she's trying to sort out something herself. So it is going to be, again, from... Um, I do actually have a bad guy's point of view, again. I just find it... I know, I think my, a lot of writers and actors and stuff said that the, the, the bad guys are more interesting than kind of right. Yes. I see some nods at the back of the head there. OK, right, so I always get nervous when I do readings, so... Okay. So, Department of Curiosities, okay. Um, chapter one, arrivals, surprises and escapes. I should have left you where I found you, Tilly whispered. She shoved her gloved hand into the coat pocket and pulled out a brass covered sphere. <coughs> Sorry, a brass covered sphere, the size of a large marble. She held it out before her. Even in the dimness of the unlit hall, the finely threaded steel and brass pins inserted. Partway into the sphere glistened. It's chained so that over the wrist as she turned it over. The inner content of the brass sphere was just visible. An amber glass or fitted snugly into the metal shell. Its face spun to, to its face spun to face Tilly. Thin wedged pupil looked in, onto her, widening two thirds to fill two thirds the aperture as if trying to consume every morsel of available light. She avoided its stare. Oh, don't look at me like that, she whispered. I'm not going to fall for that one again. Clatter echoed down the dark corridor. Tilly froze mid-step. Something thudded on the floor. The sphere's pupil snapped down into a narrow slip. She swung the direction of the noise. The Chinese urn at the other end of the hall had toppled onto the carpet runner. Tilly squinted into the darkness, searching for the culprit. The hall was empty. A picture formed in her mind, green eyes, dark fur. She shook her head. No, I don't think the doctor has a cat. Tilly looped the ocular balls chain over her head, allowing it to fall onto her bodice. She hipped up, this is in the way, I can't see. She hitched up her skirts and anchored them on, in place in a small leather cord that snaked from the underskirt and latched onto a grommet on her belt. Am I talking too fast? No. Okay. If, if the unruffled from ruckus continued in the hallway, they may need to execute a quick escape. They weren't exactly invited to this party. Downstairs, the noise invited guests crescendo. Piano music wafted up the stairs, party goers warbled an unrecognisable tune, conveniently masking the unwelcome noises in the hallway. Everything was ordered and civilised, as it should be. Everyone remained either in the dining room or the drawing room, as expected during the dinner party. Everyone, that is, except for the intruder who had announced his presence by knocking over the Chinese urn at the opposite end of the hall. Tilly edged backwards. Her fingers searched for the niche under the stairway where she could slip out of sight. At the end of the hallway, a lantern flickered, flickered, bobbing slowly as it moved closer. Tilly's breath quickened. She shrank into the niche and held her breath as a rival shadowy outline crept past the urn, climbed up the staircase towards the family's private rooms. Was he searching for the secret also? For the doctor's secret also? How did he know? She needed to find the workshop before he did. She crept out of the sanctuary, her sanctuary. Downstairs, piano music fell silent. She heard a faint creak of a badly old door hinge and the click of latch as, there, there, as the door opened. Sorry, I'll do that one again. I told you I get nervous when I read. Downstairs, the piano fell, music fell silent. She heard a faint creak of badly old old hinge and a clack, click of a latch as the door closed. That's important. Tilly waited. Had the guests heard the noise? She tilted her head to listen. There were no footfalls on the stairs. The music started again. She let out a slow, measured breath, emerged from her hiding place and sneaked up 
the stairs following her arrival. The staircase continued upwards past the family's private floor beyond the closed door on the right that led to the servants' quarters and to the attic. To let the stairs was a short corridor extended forward. Four doors lay beyond, sealing all from prying eyes. Tilly smiled. She was confident Dr. Waldron's workshop was behind one of those doors. He'd want to keep his work close, away from curious eyes or spying servants. This was their master's domain. They would not dare intrude without permission. She peeked along the hallway. There was no sign of her rival. Sorry, this is actually getting in the way. There was no sign of her rival. She tested the door to the nervous to the servant's stair. It was locked. He must be still on this floor. Her heart skipped. Had he found the workshop first? She kept scanned the areas around the doors. The first three alcoves were amid, immaculately clean. The alcove on the far right boasted a thicker layer of dust on the surrounding floor. If that wasn't the one, it wasn't the one the doctor, <clears throat> sorry, it wasn't that one. The doctor would forbid the maid entry to the private workshop. And that is, a, oh, I just found a typo. It was the one. There would be no dusting, no cleaning. Tilly flexed her fingers as she crept towards the next door. That was the one. Her shoulders relaxed. Her footfalls fell silently on the soft carpet runner as her pace quickened. The chains shook around Tilly's neck. The amber eye spun in its metal casing, searching in the direction of the door. Its pupil dilated. Yes. The, the orb's unspoken statement echoed in Tilly's head. Tilly clasped the bauble in her hand and turned it to face her. What do you mean? Yes, she whispered. The orb stand, stared back at her blankly in reply. Tilly scowled. I hate it when you say this thing. She retrieved a small brass ear trumpet from her pocket under the bustle and placed it against the door. Strained to listen, there was a faint scuffle. A short scrape and all was quiet again. Had the, strayer, had the stranger absconded with her prize? Tilly pocketed the listening device, slowly turned the door doorknob and eased open the door. The orb's pupil snapped shut. Danger! The orb's voice invaded her thoughts. She grasped her head in her hand. Shh! It was an automatic response. She clutched the orb in free hand and froze, hoping it had not, she had not betrayed her presence. She held her breath and tried to listen beyond the door. Silence. Then a faint scrape, a flutter, and then nothing. Tilly released the orb. It fell into her chest. <clears throat> it fell onto her chest. A breeze chilled her hand at the door, at the, on the door jamb. She peered through the thin crack of the partially open door. A puddle of pale light flickered, fluttered in the shadows near the window. The room appeared empty. Where had he gone? Anything, whispered Tilly. The orb usually had an insight on things unseen, but now it lay quiet, only, its only reply a widening of its aperture. Tilly glanced along the hall toward the stairs. They were in full view of any latecomer. We can't, we can't wait here all night. She pushed open the door. Another rush of cold air greeted her. The far window was open. Parted curtains fluttered in the brisk breeze. Light from the discarded lamp on the desk danced fitfully. Tilly entered, closed the door behind her and leaned against the door. A key nudged in her back. She grinned, how fortuitous. She locked the door and slipped the, the key into her pocket. The orb twitched, as thoughts formed in Tilly's mind. No, I don't think the doctor would leave the window open at this time of year, replied Tilly. The orb whispered again. No, he wouldn't leave the curtains open for all of London to see his work in progress either. Questions, questions. Tilly rolled her eyes. Now the orb chose incessant chatter. She was grateful that the rest of the world could not hear it. It would only lead to more questions, questions that she could not yet answer. Quiet, she whispered through gritted teeth. Tilly closed the room, crossed the room, collected the poker from the fireplace on the way and navigated her way through a narrow path. Sorry, I can see you in the corner of my eye and I hope you're not going too fast, sorry. <laughs> I'll talk faster. <laughs> and navigated her way to a narrow path between the stacks of crates near the desk until she reached the window. She poked at the curtains, nothing. Her grip on the poker relaxed. She peered out the window. A sea of slate rules stretched in every direction. There was a tink on the break, tink of breaking tile. A grated sound near one of the chimneys caught her attention. Something scrambled in the dark. Tilly grasped the till, the sill, and leaned on the window. A lone figure, barely visible against the night sky, fled over the, the roof edge. Gone. Tilly turned back to the doctor's workshop. Yes, 
but hopefully not with our prize. Now, what, how much time have I got? Five to eleven. Okay. Oh, I might leave it there because, yeah. So, and if you're wondering that, that's that's what the professor say. Okay. So, um, I have a, a, a few little books with the first chapter down there. There's little giveaways if you're interested as well. So, if you want to see what happens after that. Um, then the questions. Are anything else? Where did I get this? was given to me for my anniversary, for our wedding anniversary by my hubby, and I think I got it at AliExpress, I think. But yes, it's mine. Someone's already tried to buy it off me. It's mine. <laughs> okay, so um, these three, that's the, that's, the, that's the full series for the Viola Stewart series at this particular point in time. So I've got all three books down there. The new one is going to be Department of Curiosity, so it's the same world, different characters. Um, um, it's, Due to health issues this year, I was going to try to get it out for Supernova, but that may not happen. It's probably more likely it's going to come out early next year. So you can sign up for my newsletter and I can tell you how to pre-order it. Um, and that's actually going to be a thicker one, so it's going to be that twice as thick. It's actually a novel length, so it's not a novella or short stories or anything. It's actually full length and there, there's going to be two, possibly three books in this one. Um, I've also got Aunt Enid, which is um, the, the paranormal fantasy mystery as well. Um, and I'm down in the corner, so head down the end there, turn left at 5B, that's one with chain mail, so you can't miss that one. And head over towards where, near where the bands are, and I'm just at the end on the left there. Um, yeah, so anyone else got anything? Thank you. Thank you for turning up, it was lovely, I had people here.